Well, hello there, boys and girls. Get ready for your next installment of Flip Class Without Glasses. And this flip, flip class, flip flat, flip flow, flip class video will be exploring population dynamics. First things first, keep in mind that the environment is still the number one most important factor in determining what is possible for populations. A big one, geographic range, that's, you know, what area they can actually live in. The density, you know, how thickly they can be in there. Remember, density, uh, that's a unit of how much per how much space you have. Distribution would be, you know, are they in this or that area within that geographic range? Do they like certain areas a little more, a little less? And then the age structure, which is a really cool idea, um, just sort of looks at, you know, are most of the members of the population really old? Are most of them really young? You know, what members of the population seem to be most successful? So those are the main factors that the environment can control along with the growth rate. And so here we have an example. This is the geographic range for the red squirrel. Now we don't have a whole lot of red squirrels in this part of Ohio, so that it goes all the way down uh, to central and a little bit lower Ohio. For the most part, the red squirrel is something you sort of see up in the northern part of Ohio, uh, found throughout the mitten of Michigan. So that's an example of the geographic range. And so now let's look at density and distribution. All right, remember density is how much compared to how much space. So for example, here are two boxes that have the same amount of red spheres in them, but you can see, uh, well, well, you can see that's clearly false. But you see this one also has a higher density because same space, more spheres makes a, well, higher density. Alternatively, if we squish this sphere down to where it's really, really small, even though it's fewer spheres because it's also a lot less space, it could end up being that this box on the other side could have a much, much higher density still. So it's not about the number, it's about the number compared to how much space they have. Now in addition to that, we also have distribution. And that's just how they spread themselves out. You can see we have three examples. We have evenly spaced, if this area was a nice grid, they're evenly spaced here. You can also have randomly spaced, they're just, there they are. And then clumped spacing, here they are, they're clumped into different areas. Here's a pretty, pretty picture of some penguins. Look at them being all penguin-like. And you can see in the picture that they are all pretty much evenly spread out. And look at these two adorable fellers right here. But the rest of them pretty evenly spaced. Uh, those two are showing good clumped or group distribution. Here are some beautiful flowers. And you see that the colors are just spread all over the place. And for the most part, you know, the red ones are in the back. But yeah, they're just sort of all over. It was kind of random. And then here are some lumbriculus worms, which are really, uh, they're kind of cool creatures. And you can see that that's a, well, it's a big old clump right there. So there's three ways that they uh, will get together. Those are different methods of dis, uh, dispersing through an area, dispersal. Age structure, basically just it's an age profile is another name for it. It's basically just, you know, you look at the males, you look at the females, how old is most of the population? And that is our age structure. Uh, the reason why it's important to look at is because most species of organisms will only mate once they reach what they call maturity. All right, remember, only the females will bear offspring, so the maturity uh, is really important for the females especially, uh, unless it's sea horses and other stuff. So in understanding the age structure, and we understand where the maturity is and when they're mature enough to reproduce, then we can actually get a good idea of the birth rate and the death rate. And once you have a good understanding of the birth rate and the death rate, you will actually have a good understanding of the growth rate. And the growth rate can be positive or it can be negative. We wouldn't just talk about the birth or death rate isolated, we talk about the growth rate altogether. Here is the penguin is cross country skiing up the hill, which is kind of rough. And there's the population is getting larger, that'd be positive growth rate. And then over here in the red, since it's negative, would be, you know, he's going down the hill, penguin here is having a good time. Maybe it's a female penguin, I don't know. So she's having a really good time and she's going down the hill, but the population is getting smaller because it has a negative growth rate. So here are some uh, types of growth rates. There is exponential growth. Exponential, think like your equations, and they're going to be graphed exponentially. The other name for it is R-selected. Make sure 
lowercase r, just like we have up here on the screen, lowercase r. The r is for rate. So in exponential growth, the only factor that really determines the growth is the rate of growth. The higher the rate, the faster the growth. The lower the rate, the slower the growth. Usually these are for small species. They reproduce very quickly and they just consume entire areas. Bacteria, textbook example of an R-selected species. Smaller things that just multiply en masse and take over. Logistic growth is the other type of growth model. And this is actually called K-selected. Important that the K is capital, capital K. Use your consonants there, capital K. And with the capital K, the K there actually stands for the carrying capacity. It's a variable, well, it's actually a constant in an equation where K is the carrying capacity. So that's the largest, really, that the population can ever be. That's how many uh, can fit, can be carried by that ecosystem. So that's why we call it the carrying capacity. Now, with the carrying capacity, the R can change. The rate of growth can change. However, the K will remain a constant. The K remains a constant, meaning the carrying capacity will not change. So for the most part, even though R could be variable, the population can only ever reach a specific size. It's limited by the carrying capacity. So here are some diagrams that really show you that and show you how it looks mathematically. They show you exponential growth versus logistic growth. If we look at the bacteria growth up here, you can see textbook example, exponential growth. See how it starts out around zero and just goes right up. That's exponential growth. Here's another one showing exponential growth in the elephant population. Elephants actually tend to be a logistic growth species. They tend to be K-selected. However, here they're experiencing exponential growth. And you see again, they start at zero. They give that textbook exponential growth curve. There they are. And you'll notice that as the time goes on, the population gets larger. And at the end, once it hits a certain point, I mean, that growth rate stays up. It just goes. Now, if you look at the big one in the middle, you'll see we have logistic growth. And it's a little bit different. The major difference here, again, is that you have the carrying capacity marked. So if these are numbers, you know, let's say this is 100. Here's 200, and then 300 would be up there. So around, I don't know, what's that, 270. So around 270, there's our carrying capacity. You'll notice we have exponential growth at first. That's the important thing. Look at that. That part right there, that looks exactly like our growth before. So even logistic growth in the early stages starts out as exponential and then you'll hit phase two. And once you hit phase two then the growth slows. You can see right in here that it has slowed down. Once it hits the it slows down, it lessens out as it reaches the carrying capacity and just like the asymptote in algebra it reaches it. However, Unlike the asymptote, it can actually cross it. And look what happens when it does cross it. Many populations, once they reach a carrying capacity, will sort of warble around it, just like our uh, logistic growth model here is showing. Once you hit phase three, it'll stabilize and it'll be at or around the carrying capacity. If it goes too far over it, well, you know, the badness could happen. Nobody likes the badness. So here's where it gets pretty crazy. If you bring in invasive species, invasive species are species that really have invaded the area. They've come from far away and they're usually brought to an area where they have no natural predators, where they don't have uh, the same kind of competition that they would have, and so it's in a new area. They almost always show exponential growth. So because they're brand new, they tend to colonize an area, they'll act almost like a pioneer species and just take out because they'll easily outcompete anything else that is in their niche due to their invasive abilities. A great example are the zebra mussel. They look like these. Now the mussel is not the zebra part, it's the shell. As you can see here, the shell is what is zebra-like about them with the nice stripes. Now the zebra mussel are originally from over in here. But now they're living all in how. You'll notice that how is not how because there is not how. And so they came over in biolist water on the boats from over in Europe, especially England. And then when we sailed inland on the rivers, they've actually taken over the Great Lakes, taken over much of the rivers. They've actually started crashing ecosystems because they showed our selected growth to the point that they consumed all the resources. 
outcompeted all our native species. Biodiversity went into the turlet, and then, uh, well, they're going to die too once they run out of resources. That's sort of the danger of your R-selected growth. There's other invasive species. Alrighty, so population size, there are some limiting factors, and some of them actually deal with our community interactions that we talked about earlier. So competition, right, if you have a lot of competition, that's going to keep the population size a little bit lower because there's only so many resources to go around. Remember, it's putting everybody at a disadvantage. Predation is another one that's really going to limit things because, you know, once you get a lot, well, then they can be eaten, and then there'll be a lot of predators, so it usually keeps populations in check. Uh, parasitism and disease, larger populations usually have a higher density. Anytime you have a high density population, you're at very good risk for diseases and parasites because many of those are spread uh, from contact or you know air to air. And so it's usually spread a lot faster in higher density situations. Unusual weather, if you know there's a drought or if it's unusually rainy like it was in the summer, you know, a lot of the things that I grow in my garden didn't like it. Uh, some of the things the corn did really, really well. The weeds did incredibly well. So, you know, weird weathers and natural disasters, you know, all of those can really affect the size and dispersal and distribution of your population. But especially, uh, those are density dependent factors with the predation and the disease and the competition. Case in point, we're going to look at predation. This is a map showing you Isle Royale National Park which is actually this island right up here on Michigan in the Great Lake. And here's a graph that's actually showing you the moose and wolf population year to year in that. And so you can see the moose are shown in red, the wolves are shown in blue. And I'll use the black to signify important events, like for example, right here the wolf population going down, and you can see then the moose population goes up. Makes sense because the wolves eat the meese and when the meese and run out of the foods in the woods and is in, then the wolves will be not there to eat them. So then look, once we've got more moose, then the wolves went up, and then the moose are like, crap guys, we got eaten. Now what was really fun, this is showing you another density dependent factor here, CPV, that's a virus in the wolves that, well you can see what it did to the population, it took them out. So the wolf population actually got too high. You can imagine that the carrying capacity for the wolves is probably under, and no other point does it really get above 50 and sustain them. All it usually stays around 40. And when we hit 50 here, they got a viral, and then they plummeted. And when they plummeted, oh no, sad face wolves. Then the moose population took off until, wow, so many moose. And then the wolves are like, oh, P.S., we forgot, we eat you, and you went up really high, so there's the moose population being high, or sorry, the wolf population being, so there's the wolf population being high again, and then you can see that they go back and forth. But you can see there's sort of a little, little bit of a time delay, but when one goes up, the other one goes down due to that interaction in their community. And so together, uh, the wolf population is actually keeping the moose population in check. Now it gets really exciting humans. You guys may not know this, but we actually have passed the 7 billion mark. 7 billion is a large amount of people, and if it wasn't scary enough for you to think about that many people, you should know that the majority of people on the earth are Hong Chinese, not white folk. It's Hong Chinese. This is the majority. This is what the average person on the planet looks like. So get pumped for that to happen. Better start sucking up to China now. Just to give you an idea how big 7 billion is, it would take you over 200 years just to count that high. And in fact, there's another short video that I want you guys to watch. Go ahead and click anywhere up in here and it'll link you to the video. It's by NPR. It's two and a half minutes long, but it does a really great job of showing you the human population growth.